I get the feeling that he was almost obsessively collecting data and analyzing it and cataloging it and perhaps being totally perfectionist about it. Was there a moment that you can identify that was a real eureka moment for him when it all just fell together and he said, yes, yes that's um, it? There was. Um, Dar Darwin described himself as a sort of machine for grinding theories out of facts. I don't think that's really right. I mean, um, we, I don't think that's the way theories come about. Um, Darwin, in his autobiography, which he wrote rather a short autobiography for his family late in life, he said that the eureka moment was when he was reading Malthus for amusement, as he put it. Malthus, you know, um, was the um, economist who had... Um, talked about population growth in very pessimistic terms and pointed out that populations grow geometrically and if unchecked um, they would grow um, and fill, fill the available space and, and, until they are checked, fill the universe if there was an unlimited supply of food and other resources. But that this, this doesn't happen because there is not an unlimited supply of food and so the only thing that keeps populations in check is starvation, disease, war, uh, and various unpleasant things. And that was the moment, Darwin tells us, when Darwin's penny dropped. Because he was, he knew about the struggle for existence in nature. He'd seen it. He'd seen it in, in Brazil. He'd seen it in, in all around the world where, where he'd been. He knew that there was competition. And he suddenly realized that in this competition, this Malthusian competition, the fittest would survive. He didn't put it like that in, the, in those days. He, he realized that only some individuals would survive long enough to reproduce. And therefore, those ones that, that managed to reproduce would be the ones that had what it takes to reproduce, had what it takes to survive. Natural selection, he called it. Reading Malthus was the Eureka moment. And fascinatingly, it was also the Eureka moment for Wallace. Wallace, uh, much later, Wallace in 1858, was in the, uh, one of the islands of what's now Indonesia, and he was suffering from malaria. He was lying on a hammock in a fever, and in, it was wonderful to picture his fevered brain, his high temperature, thinking of natural selection, and he tells us that in the middle of his fever, in a lucid moment, he remembered having read Malthus, exactly the same book as Darwin had read years before. And at that moment, the penny dropped for Wallace as well in exactly the same way. What understanding did Darwin have of the actual mechanism of evolution by natural selection? How did he account for the variations um, coming into being in the first place? Darwin was extremely familiar with artificial selection, with, the, with human breeders breeding dogs, breeding above all pigeons. Darwin was a pigeon fancier. He talked to pigeon fanciers. He kept pigeons. He was familiar with the, the power of selection in the form of human selection, breeding selection, selection by breeders. He was familiar with the power of selection to transform a wolf into a Pekingese, a, a, a wild rock dove into a pouter pigeon or a tumbler pigeon, uh, breeds of chickens, breeds of uh, breeds of dogs, breeds of cattle, breeds of pigs, cabbages. Darwin knew how powerful selection could be. Everybody knew that. Any farmer, any horticulturalist, any pigeon fancier knew how powerful selection was. But only Darwin realized that you didn't have to have a breeder. You didn't have to have a human selector. Nature could do the selecting instead. That was Darwin's great insight. That was Wallace's great insight. You just simply take the whole story of dog breeding or cattle breeding or pigeon breeding and you just take out the human and substitute survival, raw survival. The ones that survive are the ones that breed and reproduce. Whereas in the pigeons, the ones that get chosen by the human are the ones that reproduce. In the dog breeding, the ones that get chosen to mate with other dogs, they are the ones that, that reproduce. Darwin and Wallace realized that you didn't have to have human breeders. It could all be done, was all done, by nature in the form of survival. Uh, and um, that was the explanation, that was the driving force of all biological evolution. I'm guessing that at the time, 
there wasn't a huge amount of evidence to back up the theory, or at least nothing compared with what we have now. Could you talk us through some of the scientific developments that have been since Darwin's day that, that support his theory? Yes. Um, well, in, in Darwin's time, I mean, such evidence as there was, Darwin himself was largely responsible for gathering together. That was the difference between Wallace and Darwin. What, they both had the same idea, but Darwin wrote the book which brought all the evidence together. Um, the evidence that we have today, well, it's, there are fossils, and in Darwin's time there were, there were fossils, many of them discovered by Darwin himself, but a small fraction of the number of fossils that we have today. And in Darwin's time, people spoke of the missing link, this idea they, they, they could see that humans and chimpanzees resembled each other, but there was no fossil evidence um, to, link the, to link them. And so this phrase, missing link, was immensely powerful. And lots of people went around saying, well, I won't believe it until the missing link is found. And you still hear people saying that, by the way. Um, well, since that time, as you know, entirely in Africa, and by the way, Darwin was prescient in, in nominating Africa as the place where these fossils should be, should be looked for, because chimpanzees and gorillas were, he could see, our closest relatives. Um, since that time, an immense number of fossils have been found both in South Africa and East Africa of intermediates, not between chimpanzees and humans, because of course we're not descended from chimpanzees, but from the common ancestor of chimpanzees and us. And there's a really good um, uh, sequence of fossils that was not available to Darwin. Fossils, however, are not the most important evidence. I think even if there wasn't a single fossil, anybody had ever found in the world, the evidence for evolution would be entirely secure. Comparative anatomy, and above all, comparative molecular genetics, which Darwin, of course, had absolutely no idea of at all. He knew about comparative anatomy. If you look at the resemblances between animals and between plants, they fall on a wonderful, neat tree, a branching tree. And the branching tree works for all the different things you look at. If you say take molecules and you, you construct the tree of resemblance of one molecule like cytochrome C and you get a tree and then you construct the tree of resemblance for another molecule, say hemoglobin, and it's the same tree and you do it for a third molecule and it's the same tree and so on. And, that, and the tree of course is, as Darwin would have realized, is a family tree, it's a pedigree. And you can do the same not just for molecules, you can do the same for bones, do the same for um, all sorts of parts of the body. So I think the evidence from comparative um, anatomy was available to Darwin, um, comparative biochemistry, we can now add to that. Then there's the evidence from geography, which Darwin was very keen on. I've already alluded to it, actually, the, the Galapagos Islands, the, the fact that... Um, well, let's put it in one, in, in, to put it in a sentence, the distribution of animals on islands and continents around the world, where islands includes lakes and rivers and hilltops and trees, the distribution of animals on, on, on islands and continents is exactly what you would expect if evolution were true. Uh, if, on the other hand, say, the animals had all emerged from Noah's Ark, you'd expect to see some kind of a... I don't know, distribution centered around Mount Ararat or something of that sort. Uh, in, instead of which, what, what we have, of course, is that if you go to Australia, you find nothing but marsupial mammals. Um, and that's because early on, the mammal fauna was seeded by an ancestral marsupial. And the, the ancestral marsupial in Australia evolved and radiated into all the forms that we see over here. So there's a marsupial mole, a marsupial rabbit, a marsupial herbivores in the form of the various kinds of kangaroos. They're the equivalent of antelopes. Marsupial lion, now extinct. Marsupial wolf, now extinct. Um, uh, marsupial flying squirrels. Uh, look almost exactly like rodent flying squirrels. So um, the distribution of animals around the world in continents and islands is precisely what you would expect. Darwin knew about this, this evidence, but there's a whole lot more since, since Darwin's time.